so here's what I want to do. Okay, I want to talk about problem set three. All right, so you've, I'm assuming you have all looked at it. Maybe the best thing for me is to quickly draw a picture and then quickly go to MATLAB. The objective of this lab, other than to give you skills and knowledge, are to realize that whenever somebody tells you, you have to evaluate this, test it. And so if anything, this problem set three, I like to characterize as test the test. For anyone complaining that statistics is about applying a recipe, which it isn't, this is about testing the ingredients in that recipe. So I'm reading the prompt here. Seen in class, this scaled ratio of the unbiased sample variance, blah, 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 the guys from random variables. So we didn't actually write this formula down. That was in the notes, equation one. This is part of the, I said, you know, maybe I should or shouldn't do it. And I took a vote and we went ahead rather than back. This is in the scheme of things of figuring out what the sampling distribution is of the standard deviation. And so it ends up with a formula that tells you, yep, this is what it is. Previously, we had known already what the biases of the sampling standard deviation, of the sample standard deviation, standard deviation of the sample. We had uh, written down the variance of the sample variance, and we had not worked out the full distribution. In order to do that, it, just, it is just work. It's just adding and subtraction, and you end up with uh, number one. Forget that. Okay. Here's a different example. This is another example of the thing called a statistic, and I call it X2. This is not a chi. Okay. This is an X. And it says, get a sample and make a histogram. Now I'm going to draw a histogram of a set of numbers, and I am going to do something quickly and then I do it to its logical extreme in the following way. Here's my histogram. What is the big takeaway of this histogram? What am I attempting to illustrate? Why am I drawing it a certain way? What, did, what do you notice about me drawing it a certain way? Well, you kind of centered it around zero. Uh, no, because I didn't say what zero is. In fact, I centered it around 10 to the pi, so no. But good though, you are looking at its symmetry. Excellent. And you're figuring there certainly is a center and yeah, I have centered it. What else, what comes to mind? It seems like there's not many huge outliers. It's all close together. Uh, also a good point. Um, it's somewhat compact, if that is a word in this context. So uh, I think it's an excellent point. Um, how about yes? Definitely, uh, if I call this A, then I want to make sure that my value is X, that I, I do capture that here. This boundary of this box is going to be actually smaller than the min. And if I call that B, then I'm going to want to make sure that max of X is really actually smaller than B. So you're sort of making a point of what ends up, but I'm making an additional point that, yeah, it captures it. What does it capture? Also, it doesn't capture massive outliers. One more thing about it. Two more things. Keep them coming. You're describing the nature of this histogram to a person. Uh, the bins are not all the same width. Yes, that's what I wanted. I'm trying to make this point. Thank you. It doesn't have to be, right? Nobody says the histogram needs to have equal bins, okay? When you type hist in MATLAB, as we are about to do, it's going to give you 10 bins worst choice ever, okay? 10 is just the number, okay? It shouldn't default to 10. It should default to anything would be better than 10. You know, the square root of n would be better than 10. n divided by three would be better than 10 because 10 is an actual number. And if you just give it some data, it should work with a relative number. Bin width is up to you, okay? I'm saying that because I'm gonna keep reading problem three. It says, look, x, is based on the observed frequencies, which I call little f i in the histogram of n values. So that'll be an annotation, big n total, grouped into k bins. 
and predicted frequencies, which are called big F, from an assumed parent distribution. So now I'm going with the earlier notes here made by you saying, yeah, there may be some distribution. I don't know if it's symmetric, but I'm gonna just draw something. That sort of looks like what this particular thing could be drawn from, couldn't it? It, of course, continues to infinity, most likely. Well, not most likely, but let's say it does. Okay, so that's it. And now I'm redrawing something I have already drawn, namely that if I want to know what the predicted frequency is between, say, an A and an A prime, and a B prime and a B, I mean the area under this thing, properly scaled. And so when I call this frequency, what is the normalization of my PDF now? If I keep adding the areas, like I'm shading two examples here. So I'm yeah. asking, what is the area under this red curve, the way I have been using the, the words? Give me a number. F-I-O-N. It can't have I because that implies I haven't summed. I is an index and I need to sum over I's or I need to integrate over A oh, areas. Wow. Okay, thank you. So you say one, I say no, not in this case because I want this to be frequency, not proportional frequency. And I literally do mean here count and I want this area to be N in this case. I'm holding guns to your head because I want you to un overthink things. Uh, but also just keep it on your list of things to always think about. Is it one? Does it actually make it one? Should it be one? Am I using the words right? Here I, I, I'm just using the word frequency in the first lecture sense of saying just count the numbers, okay? How many values fit into this bin? That's exactly what comes out of MATLAB's hist, okay? And so if I use a PDF to integrate it, if I use CDF to get this integral, which I'm assuming you know how to do, the CDF is the integral from negative infinity to point A, and then you do that to point A, min A prime and you subtract, so you can get that area under any trial distribution that you want. And then if you want to turn that into frequencies as in numbers observed, then you refer it to your experiment size and that is now M, okay? So the real actual numbers of numbers, now say then the real actual number of values, like one, two, three, not the proportion, okay? So F big F is the value that I'm hereby illustrating. This, that's just part of the setup. And then this frequency here is that. That is uh, this way. So if you're ever confused, do it the other way and see how you end up, right? Don't let this be a, a showstopper. Because even as I'm writing this, I'm going like, should I divide by n or not? We'll get there again. So then what somebody here is saying, and let's call him Pearson, is, you know, why not? These are little x's for some stupid values of whatever the experiment is. This is big x. So somebody says, look, you make a histogram, you take the frequencies in every bin, the actual number of things that go into the bin. You subtract it by what you really think should be going into the bin if you had the red distribution, which you're trying to see whether it holds or not. Square that difference, normalize it by that predicted frequency, and sum it over all i's. What is my upper limit of my sum? That from to okay. Yes, thank you. Right, sum of the b, not n, because you've already counted. Okay, and so somebody, and let's call him Pearson, says this variable, this statistic, is distributed as chi squared of k minus p, where k is the bins, degrees of freedom, so k minus p degrees of freedom, and p, is the number of parameters in the target distribution that you're evaluating. So we've talked about one, two, three parameters. 
just like we've talked about location, scale, and shape, it makes sense that, uh, that well, there's three parameters, but of course you could invent more types of parameters. And sometimes both location and shape, sorry, and um, spread, scale, are captured by the same parameter. As in the example of the chi-square distribution, which only has one parameter, the degrees of freedom, from which we know both the location and the scale, and the shape if we care to plot it. Uh, the Gaussian, it had two parameters because you need two different numbers to express where the distribution is and how wide it is, the expectation and the standard deviation. An exponential distribution with only one parameter, like a Poisson distribution, is going to only have one parameter that sets, again, both its expectation and its scale in terms of that one parameter. And then there are more complicated distributions that will have three parameters. And I sort of think about the third one as, you know, more complexity of the shape. So, okay, well, this is what somebody says based on ultimately painstaking derivation in like 1870 or whatever with a bit of eugenics thrown in and i want you to look at this and go what is the most surprising thing about this the surprising thing about this equation that the like i am saying this is true I want you to inject a healthy dose of skepticism and go, hmm, really? I don't know. I think I've been a student too long. And when professors say things, I don't <laughs> uh, immediately go, what's surprising about it? Um, well, then you're fired. I'm fired. You have no business being in grad school if you're not questioning everything. So now you should question, am I really fired? Of course. Yeah, so you're not fired. Just, just walk around in your mind with this equation and go, all right, let me just, how about you check it? Does it make sense? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Just take a look at it. Tell me something. What do you do when you are faced with an equation in physics or chemistry always first? Is I check you, make sure that yeah, it makes sense. Excellent. Okay. Now, of course, here you have no units, right? But what if little f and big f had units? Then I need to know what units of the x squared are. Yeah. True. Whatever it should be, should be the same units of whatever little f and big f have units of. Right. You are saying exactly the truth. Uh, this is what happens. Okay. So now I want you to go back to when we first arrived, or rather wrote down the chi-square distribution, which had sort of a lot of squariness built into it. Because if you remember, we went from the sum of variables to, to a sum of squares, right? And I sort of said, I actually literally said, why is a sum of squared standard normals and a standard normal is sort of something that you get or rather is actually exactly something that you get by subtracting a location parameter and scaling by a scale parameter mm -hmm. and squaring that and when i look at this equation are you not missing a square here yes if you want it to be i guess unitless or to yeah. have the same form as the chi-square distribution. Right. So um, this is the sense in which that should be a little surprising. That is surprising to me. The fact that we previously derived what a chi-square distribution is based on normally distributed variables and so on, and like that is airtight, watertight. It's just mathematics. Here, I am not showing you anything that goes into deriving why x should be of a certain distribution. I'm just saying that some guy named Pearson did that, okay? And so it is surprising, and that's why I wanna test it, okay? There are long arguments for as to why the scaling isn't squared, 
and the physical intuition is out the door in the sense of units if you ever thought about that i want chi squared to be sums of squares and yeah it's sort of a sum of square but it doesn't look like the definition i had before because guess what i'm not talking about normally distributed variables i know nothing about the distribution of f little or large all i know about is that little and large f are the numbers that fall in bins on certain occasions under certain distribution that is as far or as close to a normal distributed variable as it may be but i have no information so this is what i mean by testing the test we're going to test that all right i'm now also reading in my own homework that i say for a frequency histogram in which you know that the sum is normalized to n and test it against a two prior distribution then p is three and again if we are arguing about one plus or minus we are arguing about small numbers compared to what hopefully is a sizable set of bins okay so it's not going to be that important but uh, i'm going to amend this here because p in this statement here is minus one plus p i i'm going to say that little p is the number of constraints imposed on the data such as the assumption that you have p minus one parameters in your target distribution and that additional stipulation that the little f sum to n has one more constraint that's why my example for the Gaussian has P equals three, even though Gaussian is a two prime distribution. And so add one. Then we're going into the hypothesis test part of things. It says equation two is the basis of Pearson chi two test. It says, look, this is what it is. I have a bag of data X, little x. I'm making a histogram and I choose my bins. I count how many fall into the bins. I compare the number that falls into the bins to the number not the proportion, the number that should fall in those bins if that target population really was the one having. If all of that is true, then I can compute the statistic x squared. And if all of that is true, x squared should be distributed as chi squared with k minus p degrees of freedom. Which means when I do an experiment, one experiment, then I will get one value x squared. Frederick? Yes, I'm sir. On the on the value of p, so for Gaussian it has two parameters, and yeah. you wrote that p is the number of constrained data such as the p minus one parameter and the sum of f i equals to n. So wouldn't it be like p minus one would be two, and then plus one would be three, right? Yeah. So uh, okay, so so p is okay. Yeah, I, I started uh, that wrong. I have to correct it. You should always question the professor, but also the professor always right. So I never admit to mistakes. I just fix them going along, right? So I started writing p parameters, but I'm like, no, no, I need the extra one, and I had already written this piece. I'm sticking to that one, and now I say that slightly confusingly. Okay, so if your target distribution has m parameters, and you will impose additional constraints on this thing, such as saying like, hey, I'm going to actually know that n is the number then you add one to it in order to subtract it again from your degrees of freedom. So what I'm saying and what I'm writing is consistent with what you are saying, mystery speaker who just brought this up. So if you collect one bag of data and you do one experiment, you're going to have one X squared. This is what I do. This is the one. It's 87. Okay. So now I'm drawing my axis x squared, the big x, the, the mystery x, the serif capital X, and one experiment, I'll just call it one, okay? That gives me one value. I need to use this value x squared of my experiment to decide if this hypothesis is true. If the hypothesis is true, then that holds. And the hypothesis is that I know the red F and I got all the other things and I formed this statistic. So now here is 
all you need to know by hypothesis testing. And this is always the same thing. It says you form a statistic, whatever it is. It may be bad, it may be good. You work out what it should follow as if your assumptions are true, including the hypothesis you want to test, including the number of data you have taken, big N, including the number of bins that you've taken, K, and you work out its distribution, and then you conduct the test once. And then to test a hypothesis, you check how likely that one outcome is when compared against what you think it should be like. So what the thing in the box tells me is that if everything is true, then the distribution of x squared should be chi squared, which I'm going to just draw like this. Let that be chi squared of k minus p. This is where you appreciate having the live recording here because they all start looking alike, these symbols, right? This is little x, the variable. This is big serif capital X, which is a statistic made from variables and boxes and all sorts of things with less and big f. This is a little chi. That's the function of a certain analytical expression of a certain number of parameters. Okay. Mystery x here. One outcome of mystery x. Mystery x the variable. One outcome of mystery x the variable. Chi squared is the distribution of it. And all of it is on the basis of values, which are little x's which I no longer need. Okay. So roughly, without doing much mathematics, if I put my pencil here, what is the value on the x-axis, which is really the x-squared axis, at which my pencil lies, more or less? Just pick something. Again, I want you to not overthink it. You're thinking most creatively when you just sort of need to make a decision. In fact, I was reading, I was hearing on, on, on the radio the other day that a small drink of alcohol really does improve your cognitive ability because you're like less stuck in your routine pathways of thinking. But I, I can't recommend it on the record. On the y-axis is a PDF. This is the PDF. That's just one number in experiment. Now I'm just saying I need some sense of location on this axis to help you read it. What do I put? Is it x squared sub one over two? Uh, what makes you come to that conclusion? Your pencil looked like it was halfway between the origin and where you marked x squared sub one. Um, so that may have been true, but it wouldn't have helped me further. I'm going to remove this reference. Forget that one experiment I did. I want to label my axis. And you're still asking where the max is? Uh, sort of. I would like, yes. I, uh, maybe I'll broaden my question, not exactly the max, but just something that tells me where this distribution lies that I have drawn. Help me label the um, coordinate axis, the horizontal axis. I'm going to ask a related and very different question that you all know the answer to, okay? And then you want to appreciate how close this is. Here's the y-axis. I'm drawing a Gaussian. I say this is a normal with mu and sigma squared. I'm Are saying give me something to label the axis with. Mu. What are you going to do? Where do I put it? At the max. Like, yeah, you, you're lucky in this. We are lucky in this case because that's the max. It's also the center. It's also the mode, the median. Mm -hmm. It's all the same thing. So here's mu, right? Now I'm asking, what do I label? Does it have to do with the k's and the p's? It's going to have to. What do we know about the chi-squared distribution? It's dependent on p and k. So previously we wrote this as mu, right? So. All right. Is, are we going to put a, a new yeah. on the axis? So what do I label? The max at mu. And now back to this. The max at k minus p. More or less, yes. So I think this is an important exercise. You need all to read this for what it is. It says I'm drawing a distribution that's chi squared, whatever the shape is, it's sort of like this. I'm saying it has k minus p parameters. Immediately you know 
that its expectation is at k minus p and a sense of scale is at two times k minus p. So if I'm loosely labeling this, I don't want to say that that's the maximum because you know it's going to be a little bit to the right because there's a tail, right? So I'm like, whatever, here, that'll be about k minus p. This is how you verify your work. You know, because I'm saying it, that you should be coming out with numbers that make sense that are sort of you know peaked at you know this value. And if you want to have a mental sense of scale, you know that. And I'm, again, I'm not drawing it exactly here. The width of that thing has got to be about two times k minus p, right? Because the uh, square root, because the uh, variance of the chi squared is at two times the degrees of freedom. Okay. So if I'm going to make a plot of things, I need to see these things come out. Okay. So now here is the basis of the hypothesis test. You've done one experiment. I am saying that if you did a hundred experiments, that you're gonna get a hundred values distributed over these x-axis. Let me take a second experiment and you tell me where I should be drawing an x, x2 squared. So I'll do this. I'll go from left to right and you tell me to stop. I'll go twice. I'll go from left to right and then from right to left so you can change your mind. And you tell me to stop where I should draw my next x. Stop. You want me to draw my next experiment here? No, I think there's a lag and I'm not seeing your pen in real time. Okay. I was more like halfway between where you labeled x squared and where you labeled x1 squared. Okay. I'm still doing it. More or less there here and so on. However, if I asked you, all right, I'm really just only going to draw one more value and I call it x4. Where really should I be drawing it in the presence of all the information you have here? Further to the right. I'm surprised to hear you say that. I want you to think about it probabilistically. Shouldn't I draw the next thing, whatever it is, where you think it's most likely to be drawn by me, whoever I am? Oh, so it would be closer to K minus P? It would be sort of, you know, here, right? Like, the, like if you play this experiment a hundred times, and I ask you, just give me a value. The most likely one is actually this one. It's, I'm, I don't want to imply this is at the center because it's not quite, right? So, but here's my other one, right? So what we're getting at is that if I do a hundred experiments, I'm very likely to have values like this and much less likely to have values like this because in fact, their probabilities are small, right? So if I did 100 experiments, they surely would cluster. That's the whole basis of the reasoning here that we're saying if I did that 100 times, my distribution would be chi-square because guess what? I'm saying it is chi-square and that's the basis of my test. So back to, I've only done one experiment and it is coming out as x1 squared. Like all hypothesis tests, always the same thing you're gonna find out. To test it, I'm gonna ask a simple question. How likely am I to get this as the outcome of my experiment under the hypothesis that the whole thing is true, whose distribution I'm just saying holds? And we're gonna ask that by saying, how likely am I to get this value or an even more extreme value? This is an example of a one-sided to the right test where I'm saying, look, I did one experiment and I know the distribution of possible experiments. And now we want to realize that the tails are really unlikely. We want to realize that on the left, it's really unlikely. So we could devise various ways of interpreting it. And now I'm devising this way that says, let me just calculate the probability that I'm getting this large of a value or even larger and if that probability is large, then my hypothesis is likely to hold because it's part of the distribution. It's not an extreme right end tail here. And so I'll accept it, all right? So the hypothesis test is, it's likely true if this shaded box here is big. And you define what big is at some significance level, like bigger than what? 
5%, 10%, you name it. So what's big? Well, big is compared to being small, you know, say, e.g., something where you're saying, well, if it was this extreme, that area here is, I don't know, 5%. If I drew a value of my experiment like x2, it would be really unlikely that the whole thing was true. So that could say, look, I'm gonna mark for you this value. I'll call it x squared alpha. And I'm defining, I'm not gonna do it in mathematical symbols. I'm just pointing to you that x alpha is the value for which this area is alpha. Let's say 100 times alpha in percent. But I'll stick to alpha. So if I pick a value on the x-axis, where I say the area shaded behind it under the red target distribution, known distribution, postulated distribution. If that's really, really small, that's a value that is really unlikely. So if my experiment gives me a value that is smaller than X alpha, or if the area that I calculate is larger than the area that I think is special, which is alpha, then I reject the hypothesis that this thing is true. So here, the hypothesis is likely true if this area is big, compared to the tiny area that I've defined as the small area, which is up to my taste. And that's the measuring areas. And of course, alternatively, if my value of my experiment is smaller than the critical value that I say is the really unlikely value. So you can either compare the areas using cumulative distribution function, or you compare values. And if you want to figure out what are the, the tools now that you need to figure these things out? You're going to need some sort of a PDF function, like Chi PDF. Is it Chi 2 PDF? Chi 2 PDF is the MATLAB function, which I give it a little box here. That's to draw the distribution. To calculate areas, you're going to need Chi 2 CDF, because that's how you figure out what the areas are. And as I'm writing this, I'm verifying these functions actually exist because sometimes I take my wishes for reality. Yes, that does exist. And if you want to think about comparing values and you want to pick a certain significance level, then in order to find the value that has a cumulative density distribution of a certain thing, you will need chi to ICDF, the chi square. Oh, no, sorry, that's not called that way. It's chi to inv. So oh, I need, for this here, I need chi to inv. Remember when I asked you, what is the area under the normal distribution in between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma? For that, you need the cumulative distribution to calculate those areas, and that's pre-programmed in MATLAB. If I'm saying, where do I need to stop integrating to have a particular accumulated area? That's the inverse CDF, the ICDF, the inverse cumulative distribution function. And chi to inv is the way for this function, for the PDF chi squared, how to figure out where to draw that magical marker where you can figure out that the area under the curve you know, is a certain value that you specifically want. Okay, so. I'm going to keep annotating here. This is chi to in that helps you find that point based on the value of the CDF. And then chi to CDF helps you find integrals. So for all known distributions, well, for all distributions known to MATLAB, you always can get the PDF, the CDF, and the ICDF. And so you can ask any and all of these questions. And the reason people think of statistics as a recipe book is because these things used to come in tables. And then you would say, well, what significance level do you want? Go find the value. Do your test. If it's smaller, then accept it. Or what area are you comfortable with? Calculate the area. If it's smaller than your comfortable level, you take it. Okay. So I gave you the reading last week, a little handout that was about the p-hacking and the p-value and stuff. I'm not going to use this word here because I already have a p and I already have one more. I had a p minus one. So anyone ever doing a hypothesis is only ever doing exactly this except all the things change they're having some other thing they're testing some other sampling distribution some other form that that takes under the null hypothesis 
But at the end of the day, they're always saying, look, I'm doing one experiment and I calculate how likely it is. And then I compare it with how likely I am comfortable with it being under the hypothesis is true. And so to be 95% sure, if I speak loosely here, you just, you know, choose a different area, then if you're saying, yeah, it could be sort of like, I don't have to be quite that sure. And so if you accept the hypothesis as being true until a really, really far end part of the x-axis, you're really reluctant to let go of your belief. But if you're saying, nope, as soon as the likelihood, the probability of the statistic exceeding the value that I've had is more than you know, some large number, you're really happy to see it go. And then of course you owe yourself the next page, which is to say, well, then if that's not the case, what is it? Then there's gonna be some other distribution that you must hypothesize to be true. And then you evaluate that. And in the book by, in the chapters, early chapters by Ben, Beth and Pearsall, they talk about that. It, it's the null hypothesis. You know, you reject it at a certain level, then you come up with another hypothesis and then you do an H1 alternative. And there is a probability of being wrong when the truth really holds. So rejecting it when it's true. And you need to decide what level you're comfortable with. And then there is a probability of being, of accepting it when it's wrong and you set yourself a rate. This is relevant these days in virus testing and so on, where you're saying the test could be positive and the test could be false positive, and you navigate that according to what you're comfortable with. A cheap test that you can roll out to millions of people is gonna have a large degree of false positive because you know better be safe, right? Cancer screenings these days, that's not so sure anymore. Lots of mammograms have turned up lots of false positives resulting in often unnecessary treatment, which has made the problem worse. And so that's how you know, public health and statistics go hand in hand and feelings evolve. That was gonna be like five minutes introducing the lab. So now I'm gonna actually do some of that. So I'm gonna now do a little experiment with MATLAB the way I want you to do this problem. So the exercise is for you to make yourself a grid. Maybe I'll, oh, am I gonna draw even more? Maybe not yet in the interest of time, but you just say, follow the prompt and say, look, I'm gonna generate N numbers from a chi square distribution and I'm gonna lump it in bins. I'm gonna do the statistic and I'm gonna test if it's true. And I'm gonna do that a hundred times and I'll tabulate how many times I'm right for the right reasons and wrong for the right reasons also, as in like, there's gonna be a failure rate. This test is not perfect. And then you're going to do a test where you're saying, hmm, I'm gonna draw numbers from a F distribution and I'm gonna pretend that I thought they were drawn from a normal distribution. And I'm gonna do the test statistic and I'm gonna now see that I certainly hope to be wrong I hope to be proven wrong. I hope to prove myself wrong. And you're still gonna see that you're gonna prove yourself right for the wrong reasons a number of times. And you have to get comfortable with that level of uncertainty. So let's do something like this here. Let me generate, tell me if it's not big enough. Let me generate, first of all, let me always use help. Don't go online when you're within MATLAB just yet. The quick help is right in your terminal if it's not super slow for some reason. Rand n simulate random variables. Okay. Pseudo random, which means it's as random as it gets. And uh, standard normal. And that's what I want. Oh, by the way, this example that I gave you over cholesterol decomposition to do certain things with correlations, that's, that's in here also. Anyway, so H is rand N. I'll do 100 by one. I'll add a mean, three. All these things you're gonna to wanna to vary. And I will add a standard deviation of, you know, five, okay? So, it will be useful for you to start a little function and now A and S, actually, let's, let's do it like this. If you're gonna look forward to writing the function, the function 
H is going to create some random numbers of a certain distribution. I'm going to plot them. So first, let me look at the numbers a little bit. H, does it sort of look? Okay, I'll see. So now I'm going to make the world's simplest histogram without using MATLAB function histogram. So I'll call it big H, histogram with the values H. And look, I'm going to teach you a little trick for this Pearson test. It turns out that you want to keep the values, the numbers of frequencies in these bins more or less of the same size and not really tiny. Nobody likes empty bins except me on trash day. Okay, you have to fill your bins and you can't fill them in like one thing. That's just not good enough. So I made a hundred numbers. I don't know. Let me just use square root for bins. I already have empties. I'll call it like this, <clears throat> HB is this, then I'll do bar BH1. Now I get my histogram. Bar is a bar graph. One means please fill the bars to the brim on the x-axis. Don't leave like gaps, which uh, categorical variables support. But here I want, if the bar touches it, you know, I covered it all. If the bar is empty, it's really empty. If you, for some reason, set this to 75, it makes the histogram like that, which is ridiculous because it, it is just ridiculous. Okay, so you force it to be a full histogram. I just told you I don't like empty bins and the test doesn't like empty bins and be my guest and try to do it with empty bins and you're gonna see that it's not gonna really work as advertised. But anyway, the whole thing doesn't really work as advertised and that's exactly why I'm giving you this exercise. Chi-square test is a very common test for distribution. It's always applied like this. And you, if you don't look at it, you're gonna get surprises. And so here you have the ability to do a synthetic ex experiment using things that you know because you made them and using tests that you think are true or know to be false and you tabulate at which level of confidence and at which level of numbers that you generate and which level of bins that you choose, you're actually sort of validating or disproving your beliefs, which is science with a capital Yes. So I do not like the bins having unequal values. So um, hist, that's why I don't use histogram also, which is too much high level here. But so you can set the number of bins and you could also set the bin width centers. And then you know the first bin includes data between inf and the first and the last bin and so on. And then you have hist c, which allows you to set bin edges and it's no longer recommended for some reason. So hist counts is the new name of the function. So let's use hist counts, right? So somebody now tell me what edges I really could profitably set to equalize the number of frequencies that fall within the bins having those edges. So I'm asking the following question. I'm gonna use the function hist c or hist count. And instead of saying how number of bins, I'm gonna say the actual bin edges. So let me just say, give you an example. I do minus four to one to four, and then I do the bar. Um, I get the edges back. I need to read how to make the plot for a second. I'm a little confused. But so my question remains, which bin edges can I set to guarantee that the number of values within each bin is more or less the same? You think about that while I look at the plot. Would a larger number accomplish that? No, I, I literally want, look, here's what I, what I want. I want a useful rule that says, you know what, take this together. That's a new bin. And then report that as one bin and count however many fall into that bin, and then that's what I want. So where do I set my markings? Like visually, I probably set them more or less like here, but I want this sort of a useful rule that allows me to say, fine, take these bins, and you're gonna get more or less the same values of frequencies in every bin. How do I make that a little bit more formal? I want a rule that I can program. So let me do this again, right? I started with square root of n and I got values for the histogram and I got the centers of the things that I should be plotting. Now, 
Next, I said, give me negative four to four to four. And I'm getting a different histogram. And uh, I, that's because I specified different centers. I'm gonna use hist C or hist counts. And I'll make these edges. And it comes out a little differently. So I'll just say H prime and then B prime. Um, let me not get bogged down in the implementation because I want a specific thing now. Does anyone have a suggestion of how to set bin edges to make sure that the values are almost well, the same? I have a dumb way to do that. You, yeah. you, need to, you need to sort edge first and then you pick the value for like every 10 terms and use that bin edges. I think you are saying use the percentile function. And so let me go with that, right? And now perctile is a percentile, right? So if I use equal percentiles, five, five to a hundred of the data, obviously, then I'm very likely, except at the borders, where it goes from like whatever the junk bins are on the left and the right. That's how you very close to equalize the number of values inside of the bin because you basically already decided that you're gonna call it a bin when you reach a certain percentile. Does that make sense to everyone? I, I, I just wanted to bring that in here because it is a thing that's gonna help you all uh, be immediately in a regime where things are more fun to test so that you don't have empty bins and then you can guarantee that they have a certain number of values and by using bin edges as histogram edges you get this property okay so it's 1222 which means I need to stop so I'm not going to figure out how to plot this because I functions have changed I'll either follow up or you'll you see it right away by doing, you know, help on his C, see what comes out and then how to make the bar graph. But so now let's just say that I've done this and I can even go back to my, my original, right? I can say, just, and then I suggest you start there. Just find yourself some partition. Going back to my original thing, ah, except the graphs. Square of n divided by two, a b divided by square root of two, some rule, okay. And now I plot a histogram by plotting the bar graph of that. And I haven't made these adjustments, but I'm capable of doing it with the percentile. And so now I have the little f's. I should have called it little f <coughs> because h are the numbers that fall, in, fall into these bins. Now, of course, you have the bin edges. Now you need to calculate the bin edges of the histogram you just created. Here in this case, I need to get them because I've specified the number of bins, not the bin centers, not the bin edges, and you gotta figure that out. Now, assuming that I have the bin edges, I need to say, well, now let me calculate the number of things that should fall into these bins. And so use norm CDF to figure this out because if I say, look, it is norm CDF and I'm between, I had a mu of three and a sigma of, what did I take, two. And if I ask how many values fall within, let's just say the number three and the number five, then the norm CDF of five, mine is the norm CDF of three for those same parameters times n, that's the number that should fall within that certain bin between three and five in this case. And without doing it exactly here, that means exactly what I'm pretending here that if I got this thing right, it is drawn from this distribution. And now I've asked roughly between three and five under here, what should that thing be? And that should be 35. You know, if I'm doing it right, then I may not be doing exactly the numbers right, but that's the idea. And so if I call that big F, that's one of them, then, you know, when I called the frequencies that I had, I'll call this little F now and let that be 
25 in this case. I would need to relabel the variables. Then the statistic says sum squared the difference between little f and big F divide by big F and that is x squared. That's the stipulation. Assuming that the little i goes over all bins. It's whatever value that is. Then you move to a new plot that says under my hypothesis for my particular n and my particular p and my particular k I should be having this chi square of k minus p. Now I've done an experiment. It ends up being two. I'll calculate the area under the chi square k minus p. If that area is large, I accept the hypothesis. And if you do this a hundred times and you have a consistent alpha level, then you would hope that if this test is any good and if the assumptions are valid and the whole derivation is not bogus, then you hope to reject this about alpha times, even though you know this is true. And then you can do a counter test where you know it's wrong and you try to see how many times you accept it even though you know it's wrong. And so I, I envisage you taking two distributions and then do the combination right, right and right, wrong. And then to run this sort of test, plot some of these plots, and then sort of tabulate it and say, having the right distribution and testing for the right distribution for different ends and for different alphas. And then you do the experiment m times. And you write the number of times that you accept it. And so when your n is large, and your alpha is of a certain value, then you hope that you know you're going to accept being right when you know you're right about 95% of the time if alpha is 95. But then if you build a table and you're testing that same distribution right, and you're actually doing, you know, testing it against the wrong one, you're gonna get all different numbers. And you'll be surprised how many times you could accept the wrong thing and you need to get a feeling for how many times you should reject the right thing. And all of these things are contained in this test. And the only variables that you're playing with is what you pick for thinking it's right, what you pick as a test, the number of samples you generate, the level of which you, at which you evaluate it, and then the number of tests you run M, which is make it large so that you see the true statistics of this going on because it's hard to form uh, percentage ratios of things that you haven't run a sufficient number of times. So just do that a hundred times. 